and I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker. Uh, next speaker is John Summer, who is uh, the president-elect for the Colorado Mycological Society. He's been identifying mushrooms for how many years, John? Well, close to over 40 years. You'll need to turn off your, your mute button. Um, about 40, 45 years. <clears throat> You're still muted. Okay, yeah, about 45 years. 45 years. So he knows a lot about the mushrooms in our region, and he's also a good friend of mycology societies across the country, especially the other CMS, the Cascade Mycological Society. I know he goes out there and there's associates with, with that crew. Um, but we, uh, I would like to um, present John Summer. He's going to give us a talk on mushroom identification. And um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and give it all away to you, John. Thank you very much. All right, let's see if I, oh, okay. Does that look okay? See our screen here? That's looking good. Fabulous. So um, what we're gonna talk about today are, what do you need to know to be able to identify these mushrooms that you find out in the field? So hopefully you will take advantage of one or more of the fabulous mushroom guides that are available. And uh, you get these guides and they're gonna start talking about all these terms and describing the mushrooms. And so what we're gonna talk about today is what are these terms you need to learn and what are the features you need to look at when you are gonna start identifying mushrooms. So we're gonna look at the key features for field identification of fleshy fungi. So, um, and as we go through it, you'll see uh, photos, most of which I took, of various mushrooms that, that identify, that will feature some of the, the characteristics we're gonna talk about. Uh, wait, come on, oh, that's, went too fast. So uh, most people think of mushrooms like this. It must be a mushroom because everybody keeps me in the dark and feeds me that. So when we get started, the first thing you gotta determine when you're looking at these fungi is what of the two main broad groups of fungi do these things you've collected go into? Um, most of the, what we consider mushrooms, fit in a group called the basidiomycetes. You may see that word. Uh, basidiomycetes has to do with the reproductive structures, which are microscopic. They're very, very tiny. But if you blew them up with an electron microscope, like we see in this picture here, you can see that it's this big club-like structure, which is called a basidium, which means uh, club in Latin. And there's four spores on the top of that. So that's kind of the business end of the fungus. And those reproductive cells are found inside the fungus someplace. We'll talk about that later. But the two broad groups of basidiomycetes are the mushrooms, like this Ammonitum muscaria, and the jelly fungi, like this clouds here, uh, auricularia. Uh, the other broad group of fungi that you may see are the ascomycetes, because the Latin ascus means sac. And if you look at a photomicrograph, you'd see that there's a bunch of long sac-like cells, each of which has either four or eight spores inside. But what the fungi look like are these discs, maybe, like the scutellinia or the siluria, the orange peel fungus, or the yummy morels. So those are some of the groups of ascomycetes. So when you go to identify these things, one of the very first things in the book is gonna say, you know, is it a ascomycete or is it a basidiomycete? So that's what you gotta decide. So let's stick with the major group of fungi that we're gonna talk about, which are the basidiomycetes, which include the gilled mushrooms. Uh, and the first thing you gotta figure out is, what does that spore bearing surface look like? Well, in mushrooms, the spore bearing sur surface are these flat plate-like structures underneath the cap. We call them gills, even though they're not related to gills and fish, but we call them gills. So each of those flat plate-like structures has millions of those tiny little basidia cells, each of them making four spores, and just a couple of typical gilled mushrooms here but you can see the business end of the guy right here. So gilled mushrooms, that's gonna be, you know, the majority of what you're gonna find. But often that spore bearing surface 
doesn't have gills, it may have a different structure. In the case of the bolete family, it has long tubes. Now on the surface, it looks kind of like a sponge. So if you took one of these boletuses and turn it upside down, you see this spongy surface. And if you look at it really carefully, you can see that it's actually thousands of little teeny tubes that are all pressed together. And some of our best edible mushrooms like the king bolete, Boletus edulis, and some of the lexinums with these black dots on the stem are in this Boletus family. So really important to distinguish that that spore bearing surface are little tubes, notice here, versus another group of fungi that look very similar. Uh, we'll get to those in a second, but the other ones we wanna talk about are ones that have little teeth underneath. So this is Dentinum repandum, also called the hedgehog fungus. Uh, they're yummy to eat. We also have hawkswing, Sarcodon imbricatum, which is also really yummy to eat, very common in Colorado this time of year. Um, Pericium arenaceus, the uh, lion's mane fungus, which is now grown uh, commercially and you can grow it yourself at home easily, um, has medicinal properties. These are all spine or teeth fungi. This is a really cute one, Oroscopium vul vulgari. It's growing on a, in this case, on a, a Western white pine cone, but they grow on pine cones and it's got a stalk that's sort of off center. It's got a little mohawk haircut on the top and spines underneath. Really cute little guy. So another group that could easily be confused in some cases with the boletes, remember the guys with the little tubes, are the polypores. And if you take polypore and you separate it out, it means many pores. So if you remember in the boletes, we had a whole bunch of tubes that are pressed together. In the polypores, it's more like one solid surface that somebody drilled a whole bunch of little holes in. And then those holes are lined with the spore bearing surface, spore bearing cells. And some of these common ones, this is chicken of the woods, Latoporus sulfurius. Some are stalked like a mushroom, this Albatrella species. And Albatrella sovinus, the sheep mushroom is also really common in this area. It's a very good edible mushroom. Actually, all, all of these are good edibles. Uh, another group of basidiomycetes are the puffballs and earth, spore, earth stars. Um, some of these puffballs can get really big, like this Calvacia gigantea. Uh, we have a great big puffball that somebody brought in this morning here at the Botanic Gardens. It's about 12 inches in diameter. It's the Western giant puffball, Calvacia buniana. And they are good edibles, those puffballs. Uh, if you cut them open and they have uh, all white throughout. They're not very tasty, but uh, you can eat them. Uh, some of the puffballs are interesting because it's like a puffball on a stalk. It's a puff, stalked puffball. And a really interesting group are these earth stars because it comes when you first find them when they're young and it looks like an egg. If you see my hands are together like this and the outer shell of that egg, when it gets wet, splits and breaks open and folds all the way back and you can see in these earth stars down here, they fold all the way back like a star shaped pattern. They fold back and they lift that little puffball thing up into the air. The rain hits that and it depresses the little sack and spores come puffing out of this little opening here, this little mouth. These guys make a lot of spores. Some graduate student calculated how many spores are in one of these puffballs and said if you took all the spores from a puffball this size and grew it into another puffball that size, it would cover the land surface of all of the earth three feet deep in puffballs. So they make a lot of spores, like trillions of spores, almost the size of our national debt. Uh, another interesting group of basidiomycetes that are related to the puffballs are called stinkhorns. Uh, and they call stinkhorns because they really smell. You can actually smell these things often before you see them. Um, and they smell like poop and they attract flies like down here. And the flies land on them and get the spores which are in this gooey mass on the surface. And they collect them, they get them all over their body and then the floor, flies fly away and they spread the spores around. So these uh, 
interesting stinkhorn fungi have some really elaborate shapes like this phallus and uh, This is one of my favorite clathrus ruber, which is another stinkhorn. I found a whole lawn full of these in front of a hotel in, in uh, Florida one time. It was about 500 of these growing on the lawn and it looked like the aliens had landed. So another group of basidiomycetes, we're still in the basidiomycete group, are these group called the coral fungi. And they look kind of like coral. They come in all kinds of colors from drab browns to bright reds, and orange and purples and blues. And another really interesting group called the bird's nest fungi because it looks like a little bird's nest full of eggs. And each of these little eggs inside of here, they're called perioles, is like a little tiny puffball. And the rain lat lands in these little splash cups and splashes these little guys out of the cup and disperses them. They are saprophytes growing on dead material and they tend to grow on straw and sticks. And they're really common but we normally don't see them because we're not looking for things this small. They're really tiny, like a quarter of an inch across, but they're really attractive little guys. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and look at those ascomyces. Those are the cup fungi, the ones where the spores are born in a sac. And some common ones here in Colorado include Calocypha fulgens, which is really interesting because it's the inside is orange and the outside is this gray green color. And these guys grow up by snowbanks. So if you go up to around, you know, 11, 12,000 feet in the spring uh, and follow the melting snowbanks, you'll find this guy, Calocypha fulgens, growing along the melting snowbanks. Uh, another group which we love to collect in the spring are the morels. This is Morchella esculenta. Uh, another common uh, ascomycete is this otidia. And one of the features of these ascomycetes or cup fungi is when the relative humidity changes quickly, they tend to shoot off all their spores all at once. So if you lean over one of these things when they're fresh and blow your hot breath on it and back away and take a picture real quick, you can see that the thing is puffed out thousands or probably millions of spores, this white smoke-like, are spores being dispersed out of this otidia. And a really handsome little guy, it's called the, they're called eyelash cups. They tend to be really common along streams and really wet areas in moss is Scutellinia scutellata. Very common eyelash cup. Uh, another group of fungi, well, they're technically not fungi anymore, but they used to be called fungi. They're called slime molds. Really interesting little organisms that grow in the woods. Um, they're actually not related to fungi at all, uh, but, people who study fungi tend to look at them and they're really beautiful. Uh, they just creep along the ground as this acellular, it's called a plasmodium. It's kind of like a giant amoeba eating up uh, organic material. And at some point the environment changes and they go, whoops, time to reproduce. And they stop being this form and they form these little fruiting structures. It could be like tiny lollipops or these round little, like little teeny uh, eggs on logs and on the ground. Really handsome little guys. So next thing we want to talk about is where do these fungi grow? Really important. What kind of habitat do they grow in? Do they grow in the forest? So obviously you can tell when you're in a forest, but it's important to note where they're growing or perhaps they grow out in fields with our friends. Sometimes they grow on our friends poop out in the fields. Or do they grow in urban habitats, cultivated areas and parks and gardens and flower pots? Or an interesting habitat that we don't think of much for fungi uh, are some of the um, high plains and the habitat for like sage bush areas. Um, as somebody was talking about in the last talk, uh, like the Quercus oak, the Quercus uh, oak forest in Colorado, not a lot of rain in these habitats, but when it does rain, uh, you get really interesting fungi that come up. So habitat is really important. The next thing is what are they growing on? So are they growing on the ground, like this Cortinaria species? 
So on the ground, super important. Are they growing on wood? Like this Gallerina autumnalis. So this particular little guy is actually pretty common. Um, it is deadly toxic. It has the same toxins as the deadly ammonita mushrooms, the ammonotoxins. Uh, but it's a little brown spore mushroom growing on wood. You wouldn't probably be tempted to eat it. But a good rule of thumb is if it's got brown spores and it's growing on wood, don't eat it. Uh, they can grow on poop, like the stropharia, protostropharia, semiglobata. So that's another common habitat for, as a substrate for where mushrooms grow. Uh, some fungi grow on insects. This is Cordyceps militaris growing on uh, a, a butterfly larva or pupa. And these are ascomycetes actually, related to the cup fungi. And Cordyceps species are now used um, they've been used in uh, Asian medicine and Chinese medicine for thousands of years. They have medicinal properties and they actually cultivate these now. Uh, some fungi grow in other mushrooms like this Asterophora parasitica growing on a Rushla mushroom or two different species of hypomyces which are actually ascomycetes that are parasitizing mushroom. Now this one here, hypomyces lactiflorum, the red one, uh, we collected one of those today, someone brought it in. They're not real common in Colorado, but in many parts of the country they are. And they're actually sold uh, as edibles. Uh, they're actually really good. They're called lobster mushrooms. But they happen to be growing or parasitizing a species of mushroom, Rushla brevipes, that's not edible. But they replace all the tissue with their own and become this lobster mushroom, so-called because of the color. There's also a green so-called lobster mushroom, hypomyces luteovirens, really pretty green thing, parasitizing another mushroom. Uh, this particular mushroom, Colibia atreta, they just blend right in, grows on charcoal. So if you find this mushroom, you look down, almost certainly growing on charcoal, you find it in old uh, campfires. This is the most common place where we find this mushroom. So really important to note, the habitat you're in, like is it in a forest? And then the substrate, is it growing on the wood? Is it growing on the ground? Is it growing on another mushroom, et cetera? This is a really interesting habitat. This mushroom grows in sand dunes, scleroderma macrorhizon. It's a puffball growing in sand dunes on the west coast of the United States. There's a whole group of fungi I mentioned earlier that grow in melting snowbanks along the margins of the snowbank, like this Clytosophy glacialis. In this case, it's actually the metabolic heat of the fungus growing, melted its way right up through the snow, actually created a hole in the snow. And also this Calocypha fulgens, this one we saw earlier, the cup fungus. And you can see the snowbank that's growing there nearby. And these were, uh, these both these pictures were taken up uh, in the caribou area above Netherlands at about 11,000 feet. So I want to talk for a minute about how these fungi grow, and in particular, what we call mycorrhizal fungus. Mycorrhizal, the word mycorrhizal means fungus root in Latin, and it refers to a symbiotic relationship between the fungi and the roots of plants. And in this case, someone grew them in a special environment so you could see that there's these roots and this huge waft of fungi growing through the soil. And sometimes they make these little uh, club-shaped structures out of the roots. But the advantage is for the plant, is they have this fungus growing through the soil that covers thousands of times more area for absorbing nutrients and water than the tree or the plant can possibly do. Um, and in areas where, like forest ecosystems, without the fungus, the trees literally wouldn't grow. So they're super important um, environmentally and ecologically for these uh, plants and trees to grow. Uh, here's just a list of some of the more common mycorrhizal plants. And you can see pretty much most of the things we eat 
and almost all the trees that we're familiar with uh, are mycorrhizal and they basically won't grow without the fungus or if they do grow they don't grow as well many of the our food plants like broccoli brussels sprouts cabbage cauliflower um, blueberries cranberries huckleberries beets mustards uh, spinach uh, require them strawberries um, lots of succulents sugar canes lilies etc so really important environmentally uh, to understand that about 85 percent of all land plants require the fungus growing in the roots uh, one common group that people know about uh, a lot are orchids and orchids literally will not grow at all without, without the, the proper fungus infecting their roots uh, so the next thing we want to talk that it's a guild mushroom and one of the first questions in the book that they're going to ask is what color are the spores well sometimes you can tell by looking at the at the uh, gills of the mushroom but if you really want to be sure you cut off the cap you lay it on a piece of paper and hopefully ideally you could use one that's a white paper and a black paper you'll use a white paper to capture if they're dark colored spores and the black paper to color capture if they're colored spores put a bowl on top of it. Um, you might put a little moist piece of paper towel or napkin under there, wait, oh, eight hours to overnight, and the spores will drop out of the mushroom by their millions and form what we call a spore print. And you, this shows you some of the variety of colors of spores. Now remember, we're looking at literally millions of spores in these pictures, so they can go from white like this one here. Uh, some of them are a yellowish, a cream color. This one's sort of a pink or a flesh color. These would be purple brown spores, probably in the genus Agaricus, like you buy in the supermarket. These are brown spores. Um, these are green spores. There's actually a, one mushroom that has green spores, and it probably grows on your lawn in the, in the fall. Um, chlorophyll and molybdites. Don't eat it. If it's got green spores, it'll make you sick. Don't eat it. Um, and some various different colors of brown or purple brown spores. Mycologists talk about spore color um, and they have about 25 kinds of brown, clay brown, bright rusty brown, earth brown. So it helps to start to distinguish some of those brown colors um, when you're looking at spores and spore color. Uh, when these mushrooms start out, the idealized mushroom stouts, starts out with this big capsule around it and as the mushroom grows this capsule that enveloped it doesn't grow so it splits and in the case of this ammonita mushroom ammonita calyproderma you can see that parts of this surrounding tissue got left as a big wart on the cap and another part got left as this cup at the base so why do we talk about that really important when you're collecting mushrooms to dig down with a knife or a small spade or something and get the whole base of the stalk. Because if you just grab this thing around the stem and pull it out of the ground, you'll leave this stalk in the lower part of the, this tissue here in the ground. And one of the first questions to identify them is, is there a cup at the base? And if you pulled the stem out of the ground, you wouldn't know that this cup was left in the ground. And bad news if you don't have that because it's really critical for identifying members of the genus Ammonita, which contains lots of toxic mushrooms. This one happens to be a really good edible. It's called Ammonita clyptoderma, grows on the west coast of the United States. Uh, it's called the cocora, is what the Italians call it. They're really tasty. Uh, and these large mushrooms grow about the size of a dinner plate, 12 inches across. One of these buttons I've collected in maybe three or four pounds, just one of these buttons really delicious mushroom. Well, one of the next features we want to talk about is how do those gills, the technical term for gills are lamellae in Latin, how do they attach to the stem? So the most common ones, whoops, I got ahead of myself here. Let's go back up. Sorry about that. Uh, if they're just attached onto the stem, we call that adnate or you can call it attached. 
but sometimes the gills will come up and they go right up to the cap and they leave a little ring of tissue. You can actually look, when you look straight down, you'll see a little white ring where the gills don't attach. We call those free gills. Or maybe they'll run down the stalk like this or something in between. Sometimes they have a little notch at the top here. So let's look at some mushrooms and talk about that because whole groups of mushrooms are gonna be identified based on this gill attachment feature. So in the genus Ammonita, they have what they call free gills. So we're kind of looking at it upside down and you can see this ring of tissue at the top of the stalk where the gills don't quite meet the stalk. Um, or they could be slightly notched. These guys kind of imagine it comes to the stalk, makes a little kind of a looping little notch there. Or in these guys, they run way down the stalk. There's hardly any stalk left on this paxillus because most of it's been taken up with these gills. Uh, some other gill attachments. So here's a chanterelle with the gills running down the stalk. Here's another pink spored mushroom. This is a clytopolis with the gills running down the stalk. You kind of have to look at these sort of crossways and you can kind of get a pinkish cast here to get that these mushrooms have pink spores in this case. Uh, the shape of the cap is really important. So what shape is that cap? It could be kind of a typical mushroom shape. We call this convex. It could be hemispherical, almost like half a sphere. It could be almost like a complete sphere. It could be ovoid or egg-shaped. It could be depressed. It should probably see a, sh a shrink. Cylindric, conical, companionate or bell-shaped, umbinate or mammiform, have a little blip on the top here. So let's look at some mushrooms that have some of these characteristics. So the cylindric cap, this is Coprinus comatus or the shaggy mane. Um, it's also called the lawyer's cap. They're actually good edible. Um, but as they mature, it turns into this. They kind of decompose themselves and drip away as this black goo. It's called deliquescing. And um, so that's what happens to these guys. And they are good edible, um, oops, as is their friend Copernopsis atramentaria is also a good edible, except one little problem. Copernopsis atramentaria has a substance in it called disulfiram. It's also known as antabuse. So it's a drug that they give to alcoholics that if you take this drug and then you drink alcohol, it makes you really sick. So copernopsis is a good edible, but if you have a glass of wine with it, you're not gonna feel so good. So good to eat, just don't drink with it. This really uh, pretty little cystoderma, amianthinum, has a little, little, little uh, pointy thing right in the middle of the cap. That's called umbinate. Uh, it could be hemispherical, like this Ammonita muscaria, also really common in Colorado. This guy is conical and umbinate. This is a little inosophy. These guys are depressed. Here's another conical. This is Hygrosophy conicus. So you really get a sense of these different shapes that the caps can be. This one's kind of spherical, Cortinaria cinnamomius, or funnel shaped, like this Gomphus flaccosus, or companionate, bell shaped, Paniolus companionatus. And this one's really cute. It's got a little fringe, a little white fringe around the margin. The stalk can have lots of shapes. We think of normal mushrooms having an equal stalk, but sometimes they're swollen or bulbous or club shaped. So like our friend Boletus edulis has a big club shaped stalk. This deadly Ammonita, Ammonita phylloides, has an equal stalk. Rubra Boletus satanus, Satan's bolete, has a huge bulbous stalk where the base of the stalk is actually big, as big as or even bigger than the cap. This 
Dendrocolibia racemosa has a stalk that's covered with tiny little mushrooms and it goes way down into the ground called radicating. Then we want to talk about where is that stem located relative to the cap. It could be central, like most mushrooms, like this Ammonitophylloides again, or Trichlomopsis decora, really pretty mushroom growing on wood. Or this little Mycena pura smells like Clorox bleach growing on wood. Or it could be eccentric off to the side, like these Pleurotus mushrooms, or this Cymosabe ruby, rubi, or Crepidotus mushrooms growing on wood. And you can see the stalk is way off to the side, not in the middle. Another thing they talk about is stalk consistency. So if you go to break up the stalk of a mushroom like the store-bought mushroom, the store button mushrooms you buy in the store, they're kind of fibrous and fleshy, which are these large fleshy fibrous mushrooms. But some of them, like these little merasmus guys, are wiry. If you flick these guys with your finger, they'll come shooting back and forth. Whoops. It went too far, far. They could be cartilaginous like these little chytosibulas, or they could be chalky. They break up like a piece of chalk and crumble, like Rushulus and Lactarius. Sometimes there's a ring on this stalk, and that ring could be like a little skirt in this Ammonita. It could be flocos, kind of all um, fluffy, cottony, or it could be flaring and granular like the cystoderma, or sometimes it could be slimy, this ring, or in a large group of mushrooms, one of the largest group of mushrooms that we find in Colorado, in the genus Cortinarius, it has a spider webby ring on the stalk that connects the cap and the stalk. And in this case, millions of spores have fallen on these fibrous, staining them this brown color of the spores. And this genus Cortinarius, which is a huge group in Colorado, has what we describe as bright, rusty brown spores. And many of them are bright blue colors like this Cortinarius violaceus. And here you can see the Cortina on the, or this fibrous spider web-like veil on the stem of this Cortinarius. Very common uh, genus in Colorado. Uh, there's many hundreds of species just in our state. There's thousands of species worldwide. They're very difficult to identify the species. And we definitely recommend that they not be eaten, at least in the United States. Uh, some of that cup-like structure could be left as a cup at the base and warts on the cap, like in this Ammonita with the rings there, or this Ammonita caesarea with a really distinct cup or this Volvariella, which is the pink spore mushroom that grows on wood. It's also known as the patty straw mushroom. And it's grown commercially in the Far East. They grow it on rice straw. It's good edible. And then the warts on the cap, as we saw in that earlier picture of the Ammonite clyptoderma, it could be a single large patch of tissue, or in this Ammonite muscaria, a bunch of individual little warts. Some mushrooms, they're called the milky cap mushrooms for obvious reasons. When you break the flesh, they exude a sap. We call it latex, but it's not related to latex like rubber. Uh, in this case, Lactarius chrysoreus, which means golden tears, has like a yellow latex. Or in this Lactarius rufus, it's white. In Lactarius indigo, it is blue. In Lactarius deliciosus, it's orange. So you can have latex that's brightly colored or white. And then question of habitat, how does they grow? How do they grow? Like individually, like this one mushroom, in gregarious troops, like these little mycenas, or what we call cespitose clusters, where you have many mushrooms growing out of a single central stem. So what do we want to use to identify these mushrooms? So I'm going to talk about some of the most common guides that we have. Um, our favorite uh, that we highly recommend here in Colorado is Mushrooms of the Rocky Mountain Region by 
Vera Evenson, who you might have met earlier in our panel, our first speaker and one of the founding members of the Mycological Society. And another book she co-wrote with Kathy Cripps and Michael Quo called Rushy, Rocky Mountain Mushrooms. Um, if you start off with these, this book here or these two, you'll be in pretty good shape to really get started on identifying mushrooms in the Rocky Mountain region. Highly recommended, we sell uh, this book on our website. Uh, some other good mushrooms that you might wanna take a look at, uh, we don't sell them on our website, but you can get them on Amazon. Uh, Mushrooms Demystified by David Aurora. This is a very thick paperback book. It's about 900 pages. Um, excellent guide, lots of good keys and descriptions. It's written for California, but many of the species apply here in Colorado. Uh, one of the best mushroom books I think ever published and the most definitive, also written for the West Coast, but very applicable to our area. Highly recommend this book, Mushrooms of the West of the Redwood Coast. Excellent photographs, brilliant discussion and, and uh, descriptions. Uh, he's an incredible photographer. Uh, Field Guide to Western Mushrooms, uh, Western North America, also a, a good book. All of these you can get on Amazon. Some older field guides that are still in use and pretty good. Mushrooms of North America by Orson Miller and California Mushrooms by Dennis Desjardins, also from California. Uh, the Mushrooms of North America book uh, is sort of split between East Coast and West Coast mushrooms. Uh, some older field guides, which are still in great use. Uh, uh, this National Audubon Society field guide to mushrooms is actually really useful. Um, and I did a lot of talking. You'll be tested later. No, actually you won't. Uh, but I welcome any comments or tests or questions anybody has. Um, we do have a foray coming up next weekend um, and we are pretty much over full. So um, I'm still scouting on areas I'm gonna take folks, but we've got a lot of folks signed up for next weekend's foray. Um, have we had any, uh, any questions or comments from people? Um, not yet. Um, okay. We are still looking at. Uh, I, I know I did a lot of talking, and the features right. I was talking about, many of these features are summarized in the beginning pages of most of these books. You'll find in most of the field guides, you will find the features uh, summarized. In Vera's book in the very beginning, she's got a lot of good uh, pages that talk about these features and how to use them. Uh, we also have a little handout. I'm not sure if we're selling it online yet, but we make it available when we used to have live meetings that summarize um, all those features about cap shapes and mushroom and gill attachment, things like that. Uh, it's a little uh, four page handout that's really useful for that. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, what we'll probably do now in a second is switch over to um, the expo that we have, and we've got a few mushrooms that John talked about that we can share. Uh, do you have, what, what came through the fair today that stood out to you, John, that you'd like to talk about? Um, we've got a number of bolites um, that came through. So, you know, with the tubes underneath, we've got uh, Boletus edulis and Boletus borosii. We've got a couple of species of like cyanum with, that's another bully with the dark scabers. We have a number of Rushula and Lactaria species. Um, we have a lot of brown sport species, including uh, Cortinarius and some Inosobes and Hebolomas. Um, a lot of smaller mushrooms, given the, the lack of moisture, we've collected a lot of small mushrooms like growing in moss along streams, uh, small little gallerinas and little Mycenas and things like that. Um, so we did a question that came up from one of the, um, the attendees said, uh, can you talk about how different mushrooms can look at different stages, making them hard to identify? Um, often they will. I mean, they might start off really small and the caps might, you know, they might, the cap, you can see my hand might start off like this and then expand out as it dries and it matures. But often in a normal mushroom season, 
typically when you find mushrooms, you'll find a range of different um, maturities of the mushroom. You might find five or 10 of the same mushroom species in one small little area. And you typically can see a whole range in the development of them, but typically they don't change a whole lot. In other words, if it's got like a pointy cap, it's always going to have a pointy cap, even when it's really young or it's really old. Now, sometimes as they age, they may do things like dry out and crack and the, and the colors might get washed out. But in general, they don't change a whole lot as they age or mature. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, definitely when you're identifying, if you're coming across a bunch of immature specimens or just buttons, that's going to make it difficult to probably get it down to at least species. But most of the time, you can probably get it to the genus. I mean, the other thing is if you got a little patience, if you collect mutton mushrooms that are immature and you bring them home, especially if you dig up a little bit of the substrate like the soil or the humus that they're growing in and bring them home and keep them in a, you know, cool, moist place, they will continue to mature for days or even up to a week. And you can wa actually watch them mature um, right in front of your eyes. And I've often done that where I found immature mushrooms, not sure what they were, brought them home, kept them moist, uh, hydrated for a couple of days and, and watched them mature and then was able to identify them. Oh, really? Okay. That's a neat little trick. Um, and then you talked about spore prints and how important those are, because that's going to be yeah. a key to identifying spore something. Spore color is critically important for identifying, uh, identifying the mushrooms. Um, Another question from Bruce. It says, is climate change affecting the mushrooms we see in Colorado? I can't say specifically, but I, but I could say, you know, in general, the drier it is, and it seems like we're getting much more drought in recent years, maybe as a result of climate change. Obviously, there's going to be less uh, of these fleshy fungi that fruit, or they may fruit way more infrequently instead of like every year you might see them every three years or every five years when we happen to get a wet spell as terms of the long-term ecological impact i think it's going to be more that impact is going to be more on what i call uh the megaflora what's gonna the moisture availability for the larger forests and as those change their habitat or, or get less we'll see less of the fungi associated with those forests. Right. Um, and then another question from John asked, um, the spore prints look remarkably similar. What are the print characteristics you use to distinguish them? It's just, it's really the color and you really, it really takes experience to, to discern the different colors because you might look at pink and think they're brown and you might look at you know, any of the 15 or 20 most common shades of brown that mycologists consider and without having firsthand experience, kind of confuse them. So what, what helps is to you know, spend some time in the field with people who understand the different colors and can point them out. And you're gonna get the most vivid spore colors by looking at the fresh mushrooms oftentimes. But, if you start making some spore prints, you really note the different colors. They really are distinct. Right. Are hard to capture sometimes in photographs, but when you start making live ones, um, they are remarkably distinct. Yeah, it makes me think I should have um, reminded Ed Lubau to bring some of his spore prints. Yeah, he's got some beautiful spore print colors, photographs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that definitely is something to try out, especially when you're learning your mushrooms is making your own spore prints from different mushrooms that you collect and, that, and then getting a feel for the range of different colors. And those are things you can see, especially if you're, you, you already know what the mushroom is from experience without having to look at the spore print, make the spore print, and then you can get that. They're idea. actually really fun. You can make spore prints and you can cut them cover them in glass like like a picture frame where you can spray them with this lacquer and it'll fix them in place and they're kind of artistic right yeah yeah um and another question we got what is the state of dna sequencing in mycology 
I'm going to leave that one to you, Andy. That's your area. <laughs> um, the state of DNA sequencing is uh, an ever-evolving process. Um, a lot of it comes down to DNA sequencing requires a lot of resources. Um, you need the technical know-how. You need the, the time as a resource just to be able to sit down and uh, get the DNA out of the specimen, and then you do the lab work to get the DNA sequence data. Um, right now, I think we have a lot of interest uh, in nationally going on with the Fungal Diversity Survey, or otherwise known as FUNDIS, which is uh, the recent incarnation of the North American Mycoflora Project. Now called the Fungal Diversity Survey, we're trying to work on documenting the diversity of fungi through their DNA sequence data, macrofungi pre predominantly, at least that's what we're focused on here. What we want to essentially do is determine whether or not the species we have here in Colorado are adequately and accurately identified. A lot of the species names we apply to these fungi are borrowed from their European cousins or relatives or species, largely because morphology. Morphology is based on how we determine the way these things look. This looks an awful lot like that species in Europe. But the major question is, does that species get from Europe to North America and back regularly to maintain a homogenous population kind of issue. And in biology, when you have distantly spaced geographic populations, it's easy to expect that those two will evolve to become their own independent species. So the question we have is whether or not the genetically are our species distinct from European ones or perhaps ones from Asia. And in a lot of ways, they're, the classic example is Michael Kuo's study on morels. Um, he worked with a lot of different collaborators and the DNA sequence data suggested that the morels we have here in North America are distinct species from those in Europe. So they needed to actually rename all the morel species. So, if it, that's just the case in morels, how many other groups of fungi that grow out there are actually genetically distinct from the other European fungi that we're naming these things after? So uh, the challenge is getting that DNA sequence data from all those specimens. And we have lots of interest and lots of availability to generate the sequence data. Right now, one of the bottlenecks is the analysis at the other end helping train citizen scientists to understand how to adequately measure genetic differences using that DNA sequence data is, you know, just 10, 20 years ago would have gotten you a PhD and now we're teaching citizen scientists how to do this stuff. So it's, um, that's kind of a different, that different sort of, sort of hurdle we next have to figure out. Uh, but yeah, um, that's kind of the state of things going on at the moment. And what, um, other than that, I don't see like any other questions going on. So John, maybe you and I should uh, go over to the expo and start talking yeah. about the mushroom there. Great, oh, thanks. So, um, why don't we make...